Good morning. If you're in the US, there's some people calling in from the West Coast. Good afternoon. If you're in Europe, Oxford, London, all over the continent. And good evening. If you are in Southeast Asia or Shanghai, we have participants from all of those places. Um, I'm Mark de Swan Arons, one of the founders of the Institute for Real Growth. And I'd like to say a special welcome to our um, speaker today, uh, Paul Pullman. Uh, Paul, welcome. And uh, where are you and how are you? Well, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the opportunity. I thought you were going to play the drums for us. I see behind yeah, your shoulders. That's my son. Oh, that's your son, because it's a great instrument. And we need some more music in life to cheer us up. I'm right now in London, actually. I just came back from uh, my home in Geneva and uh, landed in London two days ago to see our two children. One of them has a birthday. And slowly the things are uh, easing up here. And my wife, after uh, five or, no, sorry, seven or eight weeks in Geneva, was ready to uh, see the offspring. So that's what we're doing right now. Oh, special. Well, I'm, uh, I'm calling in from uh, Woodstock, New York. My wife and my three kids and I, we left on the day that rumor of uh, school closure started, which is uh, today, nine weeks ago. And so oh. we've been two hours north. And I think um, it behaves us to, to just think for a few minutes. And I, I've, I've, I've heard you do that in other uh, conversations about the, the crisis that's happening around us. We're going to be talking about the role of business in uh, the world. And, uh, and it seems like uh, um, this um, is a really opportune time to have that conversation. But before we do that, I want to introduce you properly to everyone. Uh, because most people will probably know you as the uh, recently retired CEO of Unilever. You did that over a decade and you, uh, you did work there that I think uh, is a lightning path for so many other organizations to follow. So we're going to focus on that. But, I, but you left and immediately, probably in reverse order, created Imagine One with a number of other uh, co-founders, uh, which, which focuses on working with what you call courageous CEOs. Uh, to develop, um, to, to deliver against the sustainable development goals. You're also the chair of the International Chamber of Commerce. In other words, you represent business and you inspire business on their purpose, the BT. And very relevantly, you, um, you are um, the chairman of the Said uh, Business School at Oxford University, which is also one of the Institute for Real Growth partners. So that's what links us. And um, for the people, because you've pulled... Uh, an audience that goes way beyond the typical participants of the Institute for Real Growth. Uh, one sentence of introduction about us. We created the Institute for Real Growth uh, just over a year ago to help uh, chief marketing officers, but also other senior growth leaders help develop and help their, or their organizations develop more sustainable, more human-centric and planet-conscious growth strategies that are multi-stakeholder oriented. And we do that by connecting them to expertise, research that we do, um, uh, case studies, and experts, as well as each other. And, uh, and, and it's in that context that I really would like to frame our conversation, because you've, you've led an example. You've also led, uh, in very senior roles, three major organizations worldwide. And so I'd, I'd like to sort of frame this, this conversation around why it's so important for businesses, especially now, to have multi-stakeholder business strategies, what the key steps are to get there, and then, of course, at some points, drill down to, and what's the role of marketing and the CMO, because so many of those are listening. So let me start with a, a question, and, and, and I will obviously let you go, which is, um, you, you, you know, you're best known for your work at Unilever, and, um, and, and I think you, you achieved both the business performance and a major shift towards sustainable uh, development. Can you tell us why you think that this is such a high priority for companies and, um, and, and why it's so important for companies to have a purpose. Well, well, thanks, Mark, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, you know, we, um, purpose is like, um, you know, you can compare it with, uh, in our bodies, we have white blood cells which are absolutely needed to live, but I don't think many of us live for our white blood cells. Uh, people are bound by a higher order of, of motivation of why they are on this world and to put it simply many of them want to leave it in a better place than they found it and, and boy do we need it. Colin Meyer recently wrote his book uh, Prosperity and Colin is one of our wonderful um, faculty members at the Side Business School 
and Colin described it very well, and he said, purpose is to profitably solve the issues of people and planet. So I felt that was always important. It's not that it's more important now or less important. I think the reason that we talk about it that way is because the issues are bigger. So we're actually having the wrong discussion by saying if it's important or not. I don't think that uh, anybody would want a, a company in its premise have more slave labor or child labor or cause more air pollution or leave more people behind or, uh, or destroy the scarce world's resources. Uh, it happens, but it's not intentional. It's because our systems were designed at times that we had abundancy. Now we've had a tremendous wealth creation in this world. We have a, a finite number of resources and, and all these issues are more transparent. So I've always believed in a nutshell that companies are there to help improve this world and to have a positive impact. And if you can show that you have a positive impact, then you know, more people will let you be around. If you have a negative impact, probably ultimately people will reject you. You know, do you like to go to the bar with someone that's always negative or, or never pays? Or do you like to be around people that lift you up that are also part of, of your growth process and vice versa? It's not different from companies, as you mentioned, with your um, Institute for Real Growth, at the end of the day, we're all humans. And I also believe that the aggregation of companies that are successful is an aggregation of humans. And many of these things that motivate us can also be applied at a corporate level. So at Unilever, we've always had a strong purpose. It comes back from its founders. I'm sure that Keith last week has talked about it. He was a great steward of it in the company and lifted very well. And we were very blessed with many of those leaders in the company. And all we had to do is really connect that back to the business and make it a force for growth. And if you look at many of the issues that are out there that need to be solved, which are simplistically put well summarized in the sustainable development goals, the issues of poverty, of food security, of lack of gender equality, of climate change, of uh, finite resources around our oceans, our forest, our land, uh, the, the wars and, and lack of, of peace that we have. Many of these issues, as you turn them around, are tremendous opportunities. Uh, we, we commissioned a task force once under Lord Malak Brown and some very smart people to look at the sustainable development goals and translate them into business language because 17 goals 169 targets is a little bit confusing. And what we found was that just looking at four areas, food and land use, mobility, cities, and energy transition, we found an opportunity of $12 trillion between now and 2030, and the opportunity to create 380 million jobs. One of the biggest challenges coming out of this COVID crisis will be social cohesion, job creation, inequality. And here we have this wonderful plan. So I've always believed like many other people, that if we are fortunate enough to work for a company like Unilever that actually has these products to solve these problems, then you know, no better way than putting that at the center of, of our company. And that's really why we had such a strong purpose statement, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, and, uh, and how we've been successful making it come alive. You know, Paul, you, you said something which I thought was really important, and I've heard you talk about this in other places, and I think it's really important for everybody to, to hear this. Um, on the one hand, you, talked, you said we were very lucky to work for Unilever because it had such a strong culture and such a strong original purpose. And Lord Lever's story, I heard that you even slept in his bed on the roof of the house. So, and to, to the really, but, but there's something important there. Um, our partner, Spencer Stewart, who is also an Institute for Real Growth uh, partner, uh, recently published, uh, very recently, the new CMO tenure studies. And they talk about the very, very low tenure. It's a short time that marketers, CMOs typically come into companies. And you talked about when you joined Unilever, of course, you came from Procter and from Nestle. And you talked about uh, maybe you're uh, seeking to be accepted and therefore going back to the root of the, of the company. Uh, but... I, I, we discover at the Institute for Real Growth that there are so many uh, people that don't actually understand and realize that most companies were created by founders that wanted to make a positive difference. And only since the 70s, Milton <laughs> Friedman, who, 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 who sort of pushed that stakeholder primacy principle. But this is about going back to the roots for most companies, not just a few. Isn't that true? Well, even the Milton Friedman doctrine should be carefully interpreted. If Milton Friedman would be born right now, and he would again go to the University of Chicago, 
he probably would be one of the biggest supporters of ESG because it's one of the best business opportunities that we have and also opportunities to drive top and bottom line growth because it is making your companies relevant for what the world needs. Uh, Milton Friedman didn't write about it because in those days the governments were more responsible, believe it or not. Uh, yes, it did happen a few uh, decades ago. And uh, the issues that we now face were not uh, transparent then. But he's always seen, um, uh, as, as did uh, Keynes, at this, uh, as did um, um, many of the other economists of that time, they've always seen a role of, of uh, responsible corporate behavior. So I don't think we should blow out of proportion. What simply happened in the last few decades is we pumped too much money into the global economy. We gave the banking world too much freedom. We redefined what the importance was to us in the world. And uh, you've seen such an amount of money being pumped in, all trying to chase returns, that that has had a more dysfunctional effect than what we would call now very simplistically the shareholder uh, discipline. Right. Um, so um, the um, uh, wealth of nations uh, that was written uh, uh, 17 years before, uh, we had the uh, theory of moral sentiment written by the same writer. And um, I think it was very much always anchored in uh, serving society. You're right, if you go back to the founders, you might find answers that we've sometimes forgotten. In uh, Jim Collins' book, From Good to Great, he talks about nurturing the core before you stimulate progress. And that's why it was so important that we went back to the core of Lord Lever, because over the time and the pressures and all the other things that were happening to the company, at least that I was representing, we might have forgotten that a little bit. So bringing that back was very good. And obviously the CMOs play an incredible role in that because CMOs to some extent are stewards of brands, they're stewards of corporate cultures, they're stewards of history. And you need to be very careful with a tendency often driven by a marketing department of wanting to do something new, wanting yeah. to show your mother that you've uh, put a little promotion out there or that your new <laughs> advertising is on air. And the brands that do well are the brands actually that are consistently Consistent. connecting to people. So you have to be very careful. And this is why the CMOs are, you know, not, I, I, I operate under the principle that everybody is important if they are associated with an organization, but the CMOs have an important role to play in this respect. To, to safeguard that enormous asset that we call intangible, which is very strange because it's not intangible, nor is it uh, just simply uh, called goodwill. It's the essence of an organization. The heart, the soul. Mm. It's the heart and the soul, and it's actually uh, as much culture as it is the brand values that we often uh, talk about because we're able to monetize that. So the main thing that I think uh, was helpful for us is we weren't that lofty and we weren't that smart because we didn't know what the world was going to be. In hindsight, I regret we weren't more aggressive. We didn't do many more things. I've learned a lot. Certainly in my 10 years, I've made more mistakes than did things that I would celebrate. But what we were trying to do was make the company again outside in. Too many companies uh, get away by talking to each other in offices, having smart people decide what consumers, as they call them, want, and then spending a lot of money forcing you to then buy it. And if you don't buy, spend a little bit more to still buy it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's not a good long-term strategy. What we did was the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. And uh, the way that that turned out for us was really to put these world's problems related to our business, put that smack in the middle and, and actually put the people that we represent, the people for whom we are here, which are often the poor, the ones left behind, put them in the middle and at the table in all of the discussions. So it's not in your interest of finance ones or what product supply ones or what marketing ones, you know, it's what, what the world wants. And yeah. uh, for well, Unilever having uh, now nearly 65% um, of its business in the emerging markets, it meant indeed quite often the ones left behind. And you know, there are some values, Mark, in life that uh, don't change. And that is also important for market CMOs and it's important for companies, but if we don't operate on the dignity and respect for everybody, if we don't operate on our principle of equity for everybody or equal opportunity, and if we don't have a certain level of compassion, which you call humanity in your introduction, I think, for your human-centered growth, the wealth is not going to focus, uh, to function. And if companies could internalize these values, 
then they are also more aligned with what is needed and will probably find the answers to most of the challenges that is out there. Well, you know, I, I would like to pick up your journey because in many ways, I think it's comparable to the leaders that are listening today. You come into an organization and uh, you take stock and it's a rich organization. It has a beautiful heritage. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, it was struggling financially and, uh, and, and maybe uh, it had lost its way a little bit. Um, how do you pick up the journey of orienting a company to goals that are much more multi-stakeholder oriented and, and, and a reconnection, if you like, to the original purpose, which is probably there to be rediscovered. Can you talk a little bit about your journey as you came into Unilever? So the most important thing is always people and uh, the company has good people and always has had good people. And I don't think we could have gotten the results were it not for the outstanding uh, quality and motivation of the people. Uh, the company is too big and too complex to just depend on one or two people to even set a direction. You need to co-create that and you need to be sure that mm -hmm. there's enough critical mass. You might not get everybody on board, but you certainly need to work on getting a critical mass to move a machine like that in a certain direction. Uh, people want to succeed, so there's always something that is a human value. They don't want to work for something that is ultimately not giving results. People want to be valued and they want to know where it leads to. These are normal human motivations. And if you can create an environment that allows you for that, you can unlock a lot. So we try to concentrate first and foremost together on getting the right people on board. If okay. you want to grow, which was really a mission that Unilever had the 10 years before, it had come down from 55 billion to about 38 billion uh, euros in turnover. And it unfortunately was at a moment uh, of what you would call th a shrinking to glory. So they decided to bring in someone from the outside for the first time. I'm sure there would have been very good people inside, but with a little bit of serendipity, they approached me and I took the job because of the values and because of the people. But it was absolutely important to put the right people in the right jobs, otherwise you don't get there. And we needed to get that growth mentality uh, back into the company. And then we needed to bring back what it was all about. When companies shrink, people become a little bit more self-centered and sometimes uh, uh, not as, as effective and, and efficient as they should be. But when you bring the outside in again, it's more important. I think you need the right leadership and the first and foremost uh, quality of a leader is to be a good human being, to know what your purpose is, what makes you tick. So we spent a disproportionate amount of time in the first years on leadership development. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, Bill George is a good friend of mine. He had written this book, True Norse, uh, he's still obviously a good friend. And uh, we said, I said to Bill, you know, let's do a training program first for our top 100 people uh, on finding their purpose. And then uh, the next year on, on in making your purpose to influence others. And the third year really to get results. And we rolled it out progressively throughout the organization. I think that was probably one of the best uh, training courses we did and uh, invested in. And it gave us an opportunity to see the talent to develop the talent, but also to have people be satisfied with what we were trying to do as a company. If your values, uh, your purpose are aligned with those of a company, you're going to be more likely motivated and uh, energized. And what we saw play out in Unilever, fast forward over the 10 years if you want to, but I could take any pick that our engagements went from the middle of, of the pack of 8,000 companies to the top of the top tercile that uh, 2 million people started applying to the company. It became the employer brand in most markets that we operated. And that's probably the biggest and best statistic. Then the second thing you have to do is, is be clear on the strategy. A strategy itself is not that difficult. We've all done that. Uh, it's the uh, implementation of the strategy that, that is important. And here again, uh, a CMO has an incredible role to play to ensure that if you represent a consumer goods company, that uh, you understand what is happening out there. You know, great leaders have a high sense of awareness what is out there and then an ability to engage. You cannot be a successful marketeer or a, uh, a CMO if you don't care about people, in my opinion. And if you don't go actively out there and spend most of the time out there. Um, I was a little bit absent in Unilever, but then when I came in, 
to, to my standards at least and on every visit to every country which I try to do continuously to reach our people. Uh, we started with home visits, we started with uh, retail visits and it set an example and it became the norm and, and bit by bit these brands again brought back what they were created for and it's then the marketeers that have to pick that up with passion. And you could see the difference even in Unilever. Brands that had internalized that stronger purpose, which for us was about half the business, um, you know, had uh, grew uh, uh, 50 or 60 percent faster than the rest of these brands. And actually, they were also more profitable. So it created a little bit of a momentum and a race to the top that we benefited from. But it could not have happened um, were it not with obviously the right people. Having a basic sound strategy that we shouldn't forget is to just to each time use the word sustainability and think you have a strategy is nonsense. Well, can but I then drill down a little bit with, that, with you on that? Because you, no. you took a bit of a shortcut by saying, well, making good strategy is not that difficult. I think, I'm not sure that everybody would immediately agree on that. I want to go really specific on one aspect, because I think that one of the things you did was uh, in the Unilever strategy and also the specific brand strategies, you um, uh, invited, forced, I don't know what the dynamic was, brands to align themselves with actual sustainable development goals. And so those, if, if I'm a marketer, I'm a leader of a company and I want to do the right thing, how do I find out where it makes most sense for me to engage socially, economically, um, environmentally, and how do I find the right partners to, do, to then do that? Yeah, so uh, I, I would say that strategy is easy. I don't think strategy is that difficult, Mark. So we, we might disagree on this, but it all depends what you call strategy. But okay. you know, if you are a, a brand manager and you're responsible for your brand, you have to keep your brand in, at a certain quality, whatever you decide to be versus your competition. You have to keep a certain price for that quality. You have to work on having your brands in the right place at the right time. You have to think of certain level of customer service. You have to make your value chain work. That's not going to change in whatever word we put on top of that. But that's hard work. But many companies forget that. So the first thing we did was created a compass, which uh, many people worked on, which basically said on these things, we're not going to compromise. So here's an overriding purpose for a company. But that purpose alone doesn't pay you money if you can't execute it and make it come alive. So... There are some basics in the business that you shouldn't forget. And then on top of that, you're adding your points of differentiation, which is where you get to with your question. Whatever business you're in, you must be there for a certain purpose. That purpose is to make something better. Otherwise, you're not needed. If you're there for a certain purpose and make it better, most likely, or I would say with a likelihood of nearly 99.99%, you will be linking to one of the sustainable development goals by definition. So without being abstract, uh, you name a company to me and I'll give you an example that might be better than me giving the impression to be smart and using all the Unilever examples. So just throw a company at me. Throw well, a business funny at because me. I, have a, I have questions uh, coming in uh, at the same time. And while listening to you, I'm reviewing those. And uh, a former colleague of you, yours uh, at Procter & Gamble, Dower Bergsmith, says hello. He's yeah. one of our participants. Hello, and, no. uh, and he says, now, you, you were already driving purpose at Procter. And then after having done it at Nestle, you did it at Unilever. If you now look back, what, what would you do now if you were char in charge at Procter? So these companies have been around for a long time. Procter has been around since 1837. Nestle, uh, as a coincidence, 1857. And Unilever never really had a starting year, but Lord Lieber started at the end of the 19th century as well. So these companies are built to last, not built to sell. And the reason that they're built to last is that they have these strong values that are embedded into, into their organizations. Not least that people are important and they spend a lot of money on trading and development, but also that they work for their multiple stakeholders. These companies have, um, have invented well before the world was popular, the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, Procter & Gamble, that's where two uh, got, got related by Marriott's uh, in-laws, uh, brother-in-laws, so to speak, um, were there to actually guarantee quality at the time that the brands were providing quality, that there was a lot of cheating going on was and, and consistency, and they said, get your money back. Lord Lever did the same with his first bar soap of sunlight. He put enormous money out there that if you had a defect or didn't like it, you could win an enormous amount of money back. He never had to pay it out. But these people were there 
because they built trust. That's really what they did. The brands that were there to build trust. And if you were in Nestle or Unilever or P&G, you might have different aspects of cultures because it depends where these companies have originated from, what their product mixes are, influences of some of the different philosophies of their founders. But they broadly share something that Lord Lever called shared prosperity. They broadly believe that everybody that is involved in your businesses, uh, be it your own employees, be it the citizens that buy your products, be it the, the value chain that you work with, be it the NGOs that care about your companies or the governments in which countries you operate. These are all stakeholders that you have to, over the long run, satisfy all these stakeholders. Um, and, and that is at different measurements. And if you do that well, then the shareholders ultimately will benefit as well. So these companies actually don't believe in keeping them all at the same level. They actually believe that shareholder return is a result of doing all the other things well. And they're actually not so focused on the share price. When you go into their history and when you get some of their management, usually when times are tough and businesses need to be adjusted, become all of a sudden shareholder focused, they disproportionately pay the price for it because it's so in conflict with their culture. So if you would be a, a P&G, if you would be a, a Nestle, or if you would be a Unilever, you would first of all, um, understand the sustainable development goals and internalize them. I personally had one of my richest work, uh, world experiences by uh, being asked by the Secretary General at that time, Ban Ki-moon, to be part of the 27, what they called eminent people to develop the sustainable development goals. I worked on that for three years. It was a bigger commitment than I thought, but it was a growing experience with some of the people in Unilever helping me at that time and from the Dutch government and the British government. And um, it allowed us perhaps a, a little bit of head start. So my first step very practically is understand the goals. Then once you understand the goals, you internalize it in your strategies. Then when you internalize it in your strategies, you have to take by definition the responsibility of your total value chain. Too many companies still uh, uh, think that their only responsibility is towards their direct impact, which is basically what CSR is towards the things that are under their control. It doesn't work anymore. If you are in the world, you have to take responsibility for your impact in the world, just like a human being. For Unilever, that means getting involved in getting out of deforestation or food uh, uh, loss or obesity or stunting or the poor smallholder farmer who still can't make a living. So all these things become important and offer tremendous opportunities and people care about those things. So once you then bring it into your value chain, you still see you can do all the things you want. So you start to work at industry level and do things together with industries. You might get into advocacy with governments to try to change rules, laws, and regulations. So these are the normal steps of any change management, I would say. But the most important thing is, is create awareness and, and of what is going on there. Helen Keller, who was blind and deaf and uh, lived not far from where you are now, Mark, she went to school at uh, the Perkins School for the Blind in Boston, Massachusetts. And mm. she actually, although being deaf blind, spoke seven languages. And she was often asked that it must be horrible to be blind. And she each time gave the same answer, that the worst thing is not being blind. The worst thing is having eyes and not being able to see. And unfortunately, we have too many people in this world that have eyes and are not able to see. So the marketeers is interesting, but marketing when I was in Spain, I was always surprised at the number of saints that were going around. Every day nearly seemed a holiday for a saint. And one day there was the holiday when I tried to call the marketing agencies. And they said, yes, it's indeed, this is our national holiday. I said, what is the saint? I should have known it. Their saint is actually St. Paul, my, my name's uh, sake. And um, so then it dawned on me because Paul was converted. He saw the light, if you believe in the Bible or not. And the whole idea here was in advertising is to convert and to see the light. Now, we've misinterpreted that. We've interpreted that in terms of often manipulating the human and the human needs and creating muscle of hierarchies that weren't intended to be by selling products that don't have any purpose, by putting people in positions of when they're weak, of, of exploiting them, like we've seen in the financial market, selling these subprime mortgages or other things. So the marketeers have, in fact, an enormous responsibility towards making this society function. 
The world cannot function without responsible marketeers because marketeers is really about driving the right habit change to what is needed to make this a more sustainable and inclusive world for all. Because any of the other directions come to a grinding halt that we have now seen with the COVID crisis. So you're in fact responsible for the world. You're not responsible just for the company that you work for. And if you can get that passion and that understanding within your brands and each contribute at your level, be it the pencils that you sell, the pellets that you make, the, the pharmaceutical products that you, that you bring on the market. You know, it's very sad to hear from statements that I was reading uh, the other day that someone said, yeah, I work for this company. Unfortunately, now they converted the lines from alcohol to health hand sanitizers and all of a sudden I'm very motivated to be here. Or I used to work for this big pharma company and I was kind of lost because we were charging such high prices, but now we're actually all together making our patents available to find a vaccine for COVID. I feel very motivated. Why can't we make that the norm? And companies that make the norm that level unlock an enormous amount of energy in people because leadership at the end of the day is not about giving energy to people. It's actually about unlocking energy in people. And let, respecting let, me, people. Um, let, let me ask you about that, Paul, because um, you, you, you touch upon the role of leadership there and, 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 you, and you challenge marketers and, and leaders alike to, to refocus on that. And what we if, hear so often, and it's actually in some of the Q&As that I'm uh, looking at while you're talking as well, it's, um, it's that people aren't being given the space, that somehow the market has dictated, has taken out the, the redundancies in the systems, that zero-based budgeting has been used to, uh, to catch everything out. And basically, people in CDN leadership and, and, they, and, and perceived investors are saying, we don't want you to focus on this because it's different to, do, to good business. Now, you've made a very strong case that it's not. But how do you create the space as a leader? And perhaps I've never, I've never felt in my life, uh, Mark, I've never felt in my life throughout my career that I didn't have the space. All the marketeers that are listening are educated. They're probably financially more independent. They made it past the age of five. They didn't have issues of stunting on nutrition. They got free education from their governments and everything. Don't tell me that you have limitations. You belong to the 5% of the world population that have won the lottery ticket of life. We're talking here about putting ourselves to the service of the other 95%. Don't give me that your boss doesn't want it or my CEO doesn't care. If it's really that bad, then leave that company. That's why companies that don't get it go out of business. Don't spend your time there because you won't develop yourselves in line with your values. If that is the case, find the companies that do. Your life is too short. Rosa Park didn't get space on the bus, but she found it. And she you... changed the face of racial segregation in the US. Unfortunately, it's coming back as you read now in the papers. And I yeah. think it's a very sad period of time. Martin Luther King didn't get space in society. Nelson Mandela was locked up. They now, kept what him you... in a very confined space. These people never complained. They never said, my boss, whoever that was in that system, wouldn't let me. Gandhi had the British as a boss. Mandela now, had apartheid as a boss. Very, you created space uh, by, I think it was on day one, you created space for the organization by saying, we're not going to be uh, reporting on a quarterly basis, or at least we're changing in the way we're reporting. So you created space. And I've had a few questions about your style as a leader. In the, in the IRG program, we talk about servant leadership. Uh, we talk about getting the best out of people and at the same time enabling their growth. Um, how, 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 just talk about your role as you came into this company and thought yeah. about the right leadership role to reorient it back to its roots in many ways. How was your journey? Mark, the best leaders at all levels in society create that space for themselves and drive the changes. We've seen here the health community step up. We've seen communities get together to help the elderly, to provide food, to take care of the sick. This COVID has shown that the real leaders are in all parts of society. And they're not held back by any system or the financial markets. They are driven by a stronger sense of purpose that is not expressed in just your own self-interest or in, in the monetary terms. We need to get out of this concept that self-worth is measured by net worth. It doesn't work. So the real leaders are people that understand that it's first and foremost to put themselves to the service of others. 
And by doing so, they're better off themselves as well. If you don't get to that point, you'll never be a great leader. And for some, it took late. It took me a little bit late to get there. But it is important that you get to that point. And then the world will open up a world of opportunities. It's not that easy. I understand that. There are some barriers. Wouldn't it be easy if all these barriers would have been taken away? But guess what? None of these issues would exist because clearly then we would have solved them already. So these barriers are there to build up some resistance in us, to build up some determination and to actually figure out a little bit mindfully how do we solve it. Like now, we find with the COVID crisis that we have enormous barriers. We've discovered that the, um, the nature, health, climate change and economy are closely linked. We've discovered that our system leaves too many people behind. We have a social contract that is awful, especially with the people that we need most. We've also discovered finally that science counts. The countries that have taken the health science do better than the countries that are denying it, including the United States, where you could have avoided half the death or more, but out of sheer ignorance of making it a political issue, you end up with an absolutely freaking disaster. So we've learned about the importance of science that we have denied at climate change. And we've also learned about the need to work together globally, that we have forced and foremost citizens of planet Earth. The, 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 COVID climate, the COVID crisis doesn't know any boundaries. So these are enormous learnings that we now need to harness also as marketeers to build them into the plans of the future. And don't you want to work for a company that is positioned into categories, into needs of the future? One of the biggest issues we're going to have is job creation. Unemployment is going through the roof. Young people even more unemployed. The social cohesion issues that we did not address in the financial crisis, which we actually made worse, has resulted in populism and nationalism at the polls and the current crisis that we're now going through. Please, marketeers, let's not make the same mistake twice and go for the easy shuffle-ready projects to think that where we came from was better than where we are now. Let's design it right. And each and all of us have that responsibility in our own lives, in the companies that we represent, which is an amalgamation of the human beings that work there, and in the other things that we can influence. And it is very surprising to me if that wouldn't lead to a better plan than where we came from. This is a wonderful opportunity, yeah. actually, to not just restart an economy, but to redesign it. I'd love to be a millennial right now. I'd love to enter the workforce right now with these ideas. And it happens to be that retrofitting buildings, building bike paths, moving to green energy like wind and solar, it happens to be that these are better jobs, that we're actually creating more jobs, that they're actually more secure jobs because they're jobs of the future. And, and, uh, and they're actually cheaper in, in, in most cases than other investments that some governments that have their blinders on are making now or some companies are advocating for. So this is where the marketeers come in, I think, to change that global narrative because often it is the narrative that drives the behavior. And if that narrative is changing, behavior changes and boundaries will change. And that's then leading to the systems changes that we need. And yes, there are some complications that I wish we wouldn't have. You know, I didn't elect Bolsonaro, nor did I elect Trump. Uh, you know, he decided to go out of Paris. Bolsonaro doesn't believe in climate change. I understand that. But there are ways around that. There are ways around that that uh, hopefully make us come out with better plans to deal with this. I, I, I'd like to, um, so one, thank you for the, for the challenge there. I think it was loud and clear. And it's interesting, I'm looking at the, the questions, but actually many of the questions are just testimonials on the inspiration of your words. So I, I, I wanted to share that just uh, as a quick aside. Uh, you're, you're clearly motivating people to change here. Um, but uh, since you've left Unilever, you created Imagine One. And uh, as I understand it, you are working with what you call the courageous CEOs that represent sectors uh, to change how business is done, how strategies are run in those sectors. And uh, I would love to just hear a little bit about what you're seeing the key growth steps for them are as, as leaders and then as they engage with their organizations and draw some parallels to perhaps the courageous CMOs that are listening to this conversation. Yeah, I don't think they're that different because if you're a CMO or a CEO, I know you all have a little I bit agree. of a different That's job, why. but you're not that different. Don't get, 
too excited about that. And I think many of the CMOs, if you call them CMOs, I think Chief Marketing Officer needs to be reinventing its title as well, in my opinion, but that's a separate discussion. But at the end of the day, uh, many of you end up in CEO jobs uh, afterwards. But I would even argue, if I look at people like Keith Wheat, he had more influence to change things than I had as a CEO. So, you know, before you ask for what you uh, wish for, think twice, I would say. Uh, the CMO jobs themselves are great jobs and they're important jobs if you assume that right responsibility. It used to be that the CMOs were able to bring this, uh, the consumers to a certain type of behavior that actually resulted in a better society. Then I think we just became complacent and we've missed that responsibility of continuing to be ahead. Now you see consumers being ahead on plastics and plastics in the ocean than most of the companies being ahead on climate change than most of the companies. 90% of the consumers here in Britain now say, I don't want to go back to where I came from before. I want this cleaner air. I want this more inclusive society. So marketeers, you know, that are surprised by some of these things that are happening are actually marketeers that have lost the plot. Yeah. So my point is first and foremost, like a CEO, stay with it. You have a responsibility. You need to carry that. Then the profession is very good. The profession is actually not seen that positively in many places versus what it deserves to be, in my opinion. But if we get back on top and lead and lead responsibly with transparency, with accountability, but you know, it's one of the most important jobs you should aspire to then in society. There's no question about that. I'm not just saying that to motivate you. That's why these things were created in the first place. So for me, we are all marketeers in that sense. Because if you explain marketeer to entice the collective behavior to move in a direction that gives us a better planet, a better global cooperation, and protects all of us in, in, in providing opportunities now and for generations to come, I want to be part of that movement. So what we found in Imagine very quickly was everybody more or less is moving the direction of the sustainable development goals. And there are a few exceptions, but basically the world was moving even before the crisis. We were starting to tackle climate change. We were looking at issues of inclusion. But the real thing, we weren't moving fast enough and we didn't see it at scale. Then you look at the job of a CEO. It's already very tough to do run your own company. We all know how tough that is for most of the CEOs. And then even if a company wants to do the wonderful things like Unilever, we had lofty objectives. Some we achieved, some we did not. Some we had to adjust. But we can only do 30 to 40% ourselves versus what the citizens of this world expect of us. Then if you have some CEOs like Unilever did, we went into the responsibility of the value chain, you might get that up to 50, 55%. Then you need to start working with other industry players, often in your own sector, but there's competitive pressure, there's mistrust. If Adidas has an idea, why should Nike join? If Procter does something, why should Unilever be part of that? So there are, there are pressure points that don't work. And then you have the normal human elements that some CEOs don't care, some CEOs are not aware of it. Um, so to change the system, to drive the broader systems changes that are often needed, uh, the current system itself is not sufficient and that's why we are a little bit stuck. So what Imagine is trying to do is very simple. It looks by industry uh, sector at the total value chain, that's very important, brings in the CEOs, that's very important, the decision makers and the speed with which we want to operate. And if you have about 25 to 30% of the value chain in the room, you can actually drive tipping points. You find that more companies want to join because they don't want to miss the boat. NGOs don't see you as an enemy, but see you as a force for good. And then governments start to listen as well. We now brought together 27 CEOs in the food industry and uh, to see how we could make agriculture carbon positive. It is now 20% of the climate change problem. It could actually be 30% of the solution. A, a very profitable market as well if you can start uh, selling carbon credit. But in my opinion, agriculture should be carbon positive. So how do you get into regenerative agriculture? No company alone can do that, but together they can. So they came together, but they said, okay, this is what we want to do, regenerative agriculture, improving the lives of smallholder farmers for all of us. But Houston, we have a problem. Due to COVID, the food chain is, mis is interrupted. Africa is the biggest victim of that once more. On top of that, they have locusts, climate change, no money, and the problems pile up. We together 
are now on the line as CEOs that are first and foremost human beings. We want to solve the food crisis in Africa. So we've been working on the last two weeks in Kenya specifically to be sure that the food system works. And because we have the value chain in place, we can now do it. Even the best CEOs were saying, well, I cannot really because there's so much bureaucracy there. And my company has so many other issues. I cannot fight that bureaucracy in each of these countries. Others would say, I can do my piece, but I need the others in the value chain to also do their piece. Now we have them all together. We make it democratic because we work with NGOs like AGRA or government institutions. And because we have a critical mass, we can talk to President Kenyatta. We can get the Minister of Agriculture on the line. And in two weeks, we've done more than in the last 12 months. That's Imagine in action. Imagine right. doesn't belong to anybody. Imagine is a movement. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And there are many people out there. You're close to Woodstock. And one of the famous songs in Woodstock was one, two, three, what are we fighting for? And at the end of the day, we're fighting for a better world, a more inclusive world for everybody. Otherwise, it's not going to function. And there is no CEO who doesn't want that. It's just that they don't know how to get there. And now that we have that critical mass, we can actually drive these systems changes. And there are some bigger systems changes that need to happen that are a little bit more difficult. How can you get a new global governance? Our global governance is broken. The WTO doesn't work. The IMFs, the World Banks, the UN. So that's why I took this job as the, as the chair of the ICC, which represents 45 million companies. Can we bring in some sanity and drive things forward? That's finished. why we created focused capital on the long term to move the financial markets to the longer term. And you see that starting to happen. So system changes might not be for all of us, but within our own worlds that we live in, we still have minor, uh, smaller, not minor, smaller systems changes that all add up to the bigger one. There's no question about it. Paul, um, very clear. And it brings me uh, to a discussion I was having with Professor Andrew Stevens of uh, the SAID Business School. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, he was uh, rightfully challenging us as Institute for Real Growth. And, uh, and I'd love you to do the same. Uh, so here, uh, as Imagine One, you're creating these industry uh, initiatives and you're connecting leaders across uh, industry, in industries, but uh, across companies. We have a group of roughly 100 senior marketing and growth leaders. Uh, these people have all signed up for the premise of driving, uh, of basically an understanding that multi-stakeholder, more humanized growth strategies will also deliver better business results, that there's no trade-off there. Uh, but they're also all part of this program. So they've, they've taken, a, 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 I think, a humble perspective in terms of continuous learning, growth mindset, le and, and connecting from other sectors. What would be some of your challenges and, and encouragements to this network called the Institute for Real Growth? Well, so that's a very good question, Mark, and I would need to understand a little bit more all the things you're working on. But I also do believe that if you bring people together, that one plus one is 11, that you can get to things that are much bigger and bolder than each of us can go individually. The two most burning issues that we now have in this world is inequality and climate change. And then you see a lot of the symptoms coming out of that as well captured in some of the issues that we're currently going through. And because we're not addressing that, we're spending soon 10 to $15 trillion to address something, to implement the sustainable development goals alone that could have avoided many of these issues is only costing you two to $3 trillion. So why don't you together as a group embrace some of those things and say, what can we do with our voices, with our companies, with our combined scale to move some of these things forward? We now got uh, 90 companies in Germany to say to the German government, any rescue packages have to be conditional to moving to a greener society. We've just worked with a group of 300 companies in the US under the banner of Ceres, an investment organization, led very capably by Mindy Lubbers, to say to the US Congress and Senate, we need a green recovery package. We've done the same with the European Green Deal. These things happen not because politicians think about that in a vacuum or wake up one morning and have this bright idea. They happen because groups of people get together at critical mass to give the politicians the confidence to make these changes. So what are the two or three areas where you could have your collective strengths? You know, and I would say focus on the areas of climate change and inequality as probably the most important ones. 
I don't know if you can hear me, but you're frozen on the screen. I think we might have a freeze here. Yeah, you were frozen on the screen, so I don't yes, know if I, I completely lost you, and I don't know what happened. But now I see you again. I'm very happy about that. Um, good. I don't know. Woodstock is in the forest, and we've had some storms. Perhaps uh, something went down. Uh, Paul, we're reaching the end of our, 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 our talk, and I apologize. I'm not going to react to the last minute of your talk because I just don't know what you said. Uh, so I'm not going to bluff it. But I want to end at, on a personal note because um, you, you, gave a, you gave a forceful challenge. And uh, I felt it sitting here hundreds of miles away. You made an, uh, an appeal to people's personal strength, personal conviction before they get caught up in the rat race of the quarterly numbers and everything else. Uh, but let me just for the, for the purpose of this exercise, push back on you and say, people are looking at you as one of the world's most important business leaders. You've done this with a strength and a conviction that very few people parallel. So um, for the purpose of this exercise, please, can you take a step back and observe yourself and talk about your, if you like, journey on getting that conviction? Because not everybody is as strong and as conviction, uh, clear on their convictions as you are now, and you also have a few more years than many of the leaders in this program. What, how can people learn from your journey, your personal journey? Well, um, first of all, don't mimic anybody. We are all unique and that makes it uh, so exciting. And we need this combined strengths of all of us, our different backgrounds, our different dimensions. But in life, you will have certain crucibles and you will have certain moments of reflection. When I worked in Newcastle, I saw second, uh, second generation unemployment because of the steel, the coal and the shipbuilding. When I was stuck in the Taj Mahal and we were there when, when it got nice. attacked by terrorists, uh, it brought to life the value of lives and how people uh, uh, were incredibly generous to help and, and uh, help us come out of that situation. When I climbed uh, Kilimanjaro with eight blind people, um, I got a totally different experience and, and understood that uh, what disability means instead of disability. Uh, when you have uh, things happening in your families and, and dear ones uh, depart for another world, it, uh, it um, defining moments. So use these defining moments to really think about, and like we do with COVID now, to think about the things that are important in life. I know there is a certain level of financial security that we need or material security to provide for our families, but that should not drive us. And study after study shows that it is also something that isn't motivating for us. So why not say to ourselves, we're in a position already more than the other 95 million of people out there to do make a difference, to touch other people. And many are showing that during this COVID crisis right now, going beyond the call of duty to help others in many different ways. Yeah. So why not muster that collective hardness or that individual strengths that you have inside of you to do a little bit more? Courage is misinterpreted. Courage is often seen as brave or people taking stupid decisions that others are not willing to take. You know, people said you're very courageous to stop quarterly reporting. These things are not courageous. And they're not courageous either uh, when you have a big company like Unilever behind you. Uh, so there are a lot of things that are misinterpreted. Courage comes from the French word cur, which actually is heart. Yeah. The people that have courage start with the heart. It is not surprising that in this COVID crisis, the countries that are managing it best are countries like Iceland, countries like Denmark, Finland, um, uh, Norway, New Zealand. And it happens to be that all these countries are run by a female prime minister. Yes. And there is something in the female values that is worth studying. Higher purpose driven, better sense of partnership, more multi-generational, putting the interest of others ahead of their own. So these are the more human values that I think, uh, compassion, empathy, these are the more human values now that count. How can we get that into the marketing community? How can you lead that? The money that you spend in your advertising alone already is tremendous. When we found out that we had to portray women differently in advertising, and we were as guilty as anybody else to show the man sitting on the couch with his feet on the table, waiting for the tea to be served, 
by a woman and then we said here is Lipton tea by us it doesn't work anymore reflect that human need into your communication in all you do and you will unlock also human behavior that's probably your biggest potential are there two or three things you can do together because if you might not sometimes have these possibilities alone or are you might not feel ready to take a, a certain level of risks alone i understand that that's not bad at all but then go into the collectiveness of numbers i wouldn't call myself courageous i was hiding behind a big company that actually was run very well by very good people mm. and i used some of it was intellectual freedom because the data didn't exist to move the company in a sustainable direction right now you're in a much better position. We have five years of data. ESG funds are doing very well. Governments increasingly are saying we need to move in that direction. Technology has moved. The youth is shouting for it. They're all purpose driven. The job to be done now is, is different. I wouldn't say it's easier, but it's different. And a lot of these boundaries that we had to deal with are gone away. So yeah. muster again your boldness, your braveness by going together or you know, where you can in your own circles or where you can do it with a, a media group like this, this. You have a, a group like this that you put together. And it's yeah. amazing what you can do. And you're all better off for it. And I think your companies are better off for it. Uh, people say you must have had a lot of compromises in Unilever in the 10 years. You know, I don't care by numbers and I don't want to celebrate a legacy because I don't believe in a legacy for different reasons. We can talk another time. But the company is so much the better for it. And I will never be remembered for the numbers for Unilever. I will never be remembered for 300% shareholder return or profitability or growth. People will forget that. We will be remembered for having touched over a billion more lives and making, and making people's lives better. For showing that multi-stakeholder longer term business models are better than the narrow focus shareholder primacy. Those are more important things. So focus on that. And you can all make a big difference and make this world a better place. Well, it's funny. You said focus on that and your hands almost formed a heart. Um, we're, we're, we're working and, and in, in close. We're working on an article with uh, Spencer Stewart around the profile of the growth leader, the marketing growth leader of the future. And we've, uh, we've coined it the Da Vinci uh, growth CMO. And a lot of people interpret that as being, well, the, because it's right brain and it's left brain. And that's true. But he was also... The, one of the founders of the, the humanism movement. Humanism. Right. And, and we think that bringing those together, and in fact, uh, and we didn't get a chance to discuss this pre this conversation, but we're doing this with a, a sense that actually companies uh, need marketers more than ever now because companies need to understand, of course, the right brain and the left brain. We will need the science and we'll need the creativity that marketing is known for, but we also need to bring back strategies that understand from a multi stakeholder perspective what those more humanized needs are. And COVID does feel like a launch platform. If this is not an opportunity to move with momentum, to use the yoga move, um, I, I don't know what is. Paul, we've had so many questions, uh, but actually even more remarks on um, the inspiration that you as an individual, I know you're uncomfortable when I say these things, but on the other hand, you need to hear that too. A lot of people dialed in this morning to learn from you to be inspired and to get techniques and, and strategies for success. But what actually ended up happening is that lots of people wrote back and started talking about how you inspired them to grow. And that's something, there goes my timer, and that's something that not a lot of people uh, achieve. So not just on behalf of myself, not even on behalf of just the Institute for Real Growth, but the several hundred people from all over the world that are listening and that will undoubtedly change and feel strengthened by your words, I want to say a huge big thank you. Paul Pullman, thank you for no, your No, thanks for what you're doing, Mark. And thanks for everybody who being part of this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next week.